You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for joining us today. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis, and my co-host is my trusty service dog, Whistle. And we're thrilled to be here with you today to talk about working animals. And we all know about animals as pets, but our show, Working Like Dogs, brings you the latest information about animals with jobs and animals that work like Whistle. And today, our guest is Nicole Meadowcroft. And Nicole is the president of Occupaws Guide Dog Association in Madison, Wisconsin. And Nicole's going to talk with us today about the work that she and her organization are doing to place well-trained guide dogs with people who have visual disabilities. So we're really thrilled to have Nicole with us. And we're going to take just a quick break for some important messages from our sponsors. And we'll be right back with Nicole Metacroft. So please come back and join us. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Hey, ready to take a walk? Not just you, but the whole family. It's the 2009 Whisker Walk, Sunday, June 7th from 11 to 3 at the Lancaster Fairground in Lancaster, Massachusetts. Pet owners and animal lovers walk to lend a paw to benefit the animal shelters and pet charities they love. Come see exhibits, demonstrations, educational programs, special attractions, product giveaways, entertainment, auctions, raffles, food, fun, and things for adults and kids to see, do, and buy, both human and pet related. Whisker Walk 2009, a fun day for everyone. For more information, log on to whiskerwalk.org. Ladies and gentlemen, Pet Life Radio proudly presents DSPN, the Dog Sports and Performance Network. Get ready to unleash the dog sports enthusiast in all of us. From speed drawing and mushing to racing, agility, and competition, this is the place to learn all about the dog sports and activities that you can do with your furry best friend and canine competitor. So get ready for game time. DSPN with your host, Lori Williams. Every week, on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. My name is Marcy and my co-host Whistle at Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. And I'd like to welcome today our guest, Nicole Metacroft, president of Occupaws Guide Dog Association. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, we're so thrilled that you could be with us. I'm so excited to hear about your organization. So tell me, what is the Occupaws Guide Dog Association and how did it come to be? Sure. Occupaz is a in-community guide dog training placement program in the state of Wisconsin, which means we raise, train, and place guide dogs with Wisconsin's visually impaired, and we actually conduct all of our training placement sessions directly in the client's home environment so they don't have to leave their home for four weeks, which is required by most traditional guide dog training facilities. I love that concept. That's exactly the kind of concept that my service dog agency uses. Um, Whistle came from Paws with a Cause, and they do the in-home. And and I think it's so important for people who work and and have jobs and lives. It's really hard to go away for two to four weeks and be trained. Absolutely. And that was my dilemma, too, when I was in need of a guide dog and started researching guide dog training facilities and programs. There was nothing out there that would come to my home and work with me locally. I would have to leave my home for the four weeks required by most of the schools. And I had just had a brand new baby daughter or in-home business and a husband and multiple dogs. And I just couldn't leave here for four weeks. And I, I don't feel that secondary health conditions or professional commitment or family 
obligations should limit somebody's experience on guide dog mobility training. Absolutely. So how did you get your organization started? Well, after doing a lot of research on guide dog training programs and finding nothing out there that was suitable for me, I took my experience as a uh, dog trainer and started training my own German Shepherd. I had a three-year-old German Shepherd named Admiral, and I had been training dogs for 15 years, just doing family obedience and some you know, competition sports with my own dogs, and I thought, you know, I might just have to train my own. <laughs> I still have a little bit of usable vision. I have retinitis pigmentosa, so I have, a, I have a tunnel vision now. So I took what usable vision I had and what dog skills I, I had in my head, and I bought him a guide dog harness on online and just started training him to avoid obstacles and stop at curbs and did what I knew how to do at the time to get by and try to increase some of my independence as I knew how at that point. Wow, that's awesome. I know, isn't it amazing how things come from what we need ourselves and it just grows into something so much more amazing that can help so many other people as well? Absolutely, and I just reasoned that there's got to be other people in my situation in my geographical area that I could probably help. And, um, you know, years later we we have a very good training program put together and we're actually putting out some really high quality dogs and people are enjoying the experience. So tell me about the experience. So how does someone apply for a dog through your agency? We have an application process that a person has to go through. Um, We have an application on our website or I can mail an application out and once that is submitted um, the, the process begins and if you qualified to go through guide dog mobility training, you are actually paired with the perfect dog. It's all about the art of the match when it comes to putting a dog with a person. And once all of that is completed, we start the in-home placement. Um, Our in-home placement training program is about a two to three week training process. It all depends on the person's situation and their experience and what they actually need that dog to do. And being an in-home placement program, we can customize these dogs to do specific tasks other than just your general guide dog work. So that's very helpful for people, too. Yeah, so when someone comes to you for a dog, do they have to pay for it, Nicole? Or do you have programs? Do you raise the money to pay for the dogs? The total cost of training a guide dog from start to finish, and that's taking a puppy putting it with a blind person and technical support for the lifetime of the team costs our organization up to $25,000. Being a local nonprofit organization, these dogs are given at no charge to the client. We do fundraise and we do write and apply for grants and we definitely need help in that area to raise these funds for these people. Wow, that's amazing that you guys do all of that and give the dogs at no cost to the individuals. Wow, that is that is a huge gift that you're giving each client. Absolutely. So when someone applies for a dog, I'm very familiar with service dogs, but I don't know all the specifics about guide dogs. So do you assess the person when they apply? What type of assessment do you do to see what a dog can do for them? Or do you have a certain set of commands that you teach every dog? Could you tell us a little bit about that, Nicole? Sure, you bet. Once they've submitted an application, we set up a home interview. So we go out and do a home interview with the clients and we take an orientation and mobility specialist with us to evaluate that person's mobility skills. A blind person has to have had formal cane training, orientation mobility training with a white cane and they need to be able to travel independently without a dog. Um, Dogs are dogs and sometimes they do get sick and you need to be able to travel independently without a dog. So once they that also helps us match their their walking pace too so we pair them with the correct dog. Guide dogs are trained a lot differently than regular service dogs. Obviously they they help blind people, but they are trained to pull out in a harness and all of your information that you get from that dog is through that harness handle and you need that pull. So you also have to pretty, be physically able to work a guide dog. It, it is kind of hard on your body. They walk fast faster than a normal pace, about two to three miles an hour, and you have to be able to keep up with the dog and react. If the dog stops suddenly, you need to stop with the dog, 
because they're probably indicating something to you, whether it be a curb, stairway, overhanging obstacle, things like that. So once they're paired, or when, once we have done our assessment of their mobility, then we can properly pick the correct type of dog for them. That is so cool. I know when I was thinking about getting a service dog and I was doing research, and Nicole, this was almost 20 years ago when I got my first dog. You know, that was the big thing is that guide dogs actually make decisions, whereas service dogs just follow commands and do what their team member tells them. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. It is not a black and white world for guide dogs. There's a lot of gray areas and they do have to make a lot of decisions because the person they're guiding cannot see. So when you tell your dog forward, he's going to go in a straight line until he can't go anymore. So they're trained on a straight line concept per se. They go from point A to point B until they're given, they're given a direction and then they go to point C, etc. So if we're working in a residential setting and I tell my guide dog Dale forward, He's going to take me in a straight line until we hit an intersection or if there's something blocking our way, he will stop for that so I can figure out what it is and where I'm going to go from there. So they they work on a command-to-command basis. And what the guide dogs are trained to do is avoid obstacles, obviously, stationary and and moving obstacles such as pedestrians, vehicles, bicycles. Um, They're trained to stop for changes in elevation, which could be up and down curbs. Um, rough terrain, grass to sidewalk, whatever you may encounter, a stairway, elevators, escalators. They're, they're trained to find those types of items. And a lot of the, one of the most frequently asked questions I get from people is, how does the dog know when it's safe to cross the street? <laughs> well, part of, the ori- it's part of your orientation and mobility training that you get when you're working with somebody to do the white cane training is they teach you how to read traffic. So you as the driver really need to know when it's safe to cross the street by using your hearing. Um, And when you feel it's safe, you can command the dog to forward and cross the street. And if there is a car coming or a bicycle that you don't hear, the dog is trained to disobey you. It's called intelligent disobedience. So, So that's very interesting. Wow, that's the part, yeah, that's the part that I find so fascinating is the whole decision-making process and that going against what your human partner is telling you because I know how much whistle relies on me to tell him what to do and how he he really responds to my reaction. Um, But again, it's that, that huge critical difference that you were talking about between service dogs and guide dogs. But it's interesting, people always think that Whistle is a guide dog. Okay. Yeah, even though he's not, but if I'm a wheelchair user, and if I wear sunglasses, people automatically think I'm blind and that he is a guide dog. So, yeah, so we always laugh about that. You say, no, he's actually a service dog, which is very different. But I just love that. I love that they actually get to make decisions, and and the thought process is just so amazing. I just think guide dogs are the coolest thing in the world. It is a very, very cool mobility tool. Compared to using the white cane, I prefer using the guide dog. And the reason I prefer, prefer it is, first of all, you get to from point A to point B fast. I mean, it's really cool when you can't see and you're blowing by people on the sidewalk and it's it's really fun for me. Or you go to the shopping mall and, you know, you're just whizzing past all these people going to where you need to go and that, that's a really cool feeling for a blind person. That's Without the very dog, cool. You'd be, you'd be going really slow and trying to feel your way and with the cane too, you're, you know, I, I like to, I like to call the dogs obstacle avoiders and canes are obstacle locators because when you approach something with a cane, you have to figure it, you have to stop, you you figure out what it is, how do I get around this? And with a dog, he's seeing that obstacle 20, 30 feet ahead of you and he's already making his decisions before you even reach that and you probably don't even know you've avoided an obstacle by the time it's, it's, it's past you. So that's one nice thing about a guide dog. Wow, that is so cool. Well, we're going to be right back after this commercial break. We're going to hear some wonderful messages from our sponsors. And Nicole will be back to keep talking about guide dogs. So please come back and stay with us. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Greetings, human. What planet am I on? 
Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in Paparazzi, candid pictures of you and your pet. For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No, to my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. This is Marcy Davis and Whistle, and you're listening to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. And today we're visiting with our guest, Nicole, um, the president of Occupaz Guide Dog Association. And before the break, we were just talking about guide dogs and how they make decisions and how cool it is for someone who has a visual disability to have a guide dog helping them cruise through a mall or any place out in public. It's just so wonderful. And I know I I have to share with you that when I got my first service dog, it was so cool because my service dog pulls me in my wheelchair. And it was so great at the mall. The first time we got to go, I felt like I was yelling, it's a sale. And she was bolting through the mall, which was so great. (laughs) So I, I wanted to ask you, Nicole, where do your dogs come from? Do you breed them or where, where do they come from? We have a lot of our dogs come from Anthem Labradors from Harvard, Illinois. Ann Garman is an angel and she actually donated the first few few of our dogs. I think she's donated eight dogs to our program now and she's also donated a couple breeding females um, so we can start our own breeding program. My guide dog Dale came from her and he was the first dog we were the first team actually to go through the program. We use all Labrador retrievers, 100% English bred. They just, they're very successful and statistically across the country, the most successful as far as being able to stay with the person that they're placed with. And I never thought I'd love a Labrador like I do. I'm a German Shepherd person, but I wouldn't trade him in for anything. <laughs> That's great. And so do you have a puppy raising program or how does that work? Yeah, we have a puppy, a community puppy raising program. Our dogs are raised in the community by volunteer families, and they take the puppies at about eight weeks old, and they raise them until they are about 18 months old, until they're ready to come in for formal harness training. And what our volunteer puppy raisers do is they expose these puppies to many different kinds of environments and experiences. And one unique thing about our program is all of our puppies, before they go into formal harness training, have to pass their Canine Good Citizen certification. So it's just a little credential we have for our puppies and puppy raisers before our dogs enter their formal career training. So if someone wants to be a puppy raiser, how would they go about doing that? We have a puppy raising application on our website under the puppy raising page and they can fill out an application. There is no experience necessary. You don't have to have dog experience to raise a puppy. We, our program is very supportive and we walk you through the whole process. And most of our puppy raisers are on their second and third dogs already, so they really enjoy the experience. And it's, it's like joining a new family. It's, it's very nice. Yeah. Is there a monetary commitment that puppy raisers have to make? Right now, since we're a grassroots organization, we ask that the puppy raisers donate the veterinary 
expenses, such as their their shots and um, some of the raisers donate the the cost of the spay and the neuter. If they cannot financially support that, we will help them with those expenses. Mm-hmm. Um, they also provide dog food. Oh, well. nice! It's a tax deductible expense for them. And do they? Does someone have to have a backyard, a fenced-in yard, to be a puppy raiser? You don't need to have a fenced-in yard, but they do have to be secure at all times. So if they're out to relieve themselves, you would have them on a long line or a leash. Some way, they're definitely not allowed to roam free or at large. Right, right, because safety is so important. But I know a lot of people think that you can't have a working dog in a small apartment or, in, you know, in a, a smaller space. They think you have to have a big yard, and that's always something. I was amazed at how well my service dog, my first service dog, we lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and she was amazing. It didn't phase her at all that we didn't have a yard at the time. So it, right. it's amazing. Yeah, Wisconsin law says that, um, even our our guide dogs in training are allowed in all public, all public places of business, and that would include landlords allowing them to be in apartments and things like that. So, um, the laws on our side as far as getting these dogs prepared for an actual blind person. That's great. And so your law covers puppy raisers, covers the puppies as well. Yeah, it does cover the puppy trainers. Absolutely. Yeah, I know that's always a big issue so for some states have that in their state laws and, and others don't. Right. Some states, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with all of the state statutes, but Wisconsin law protects our our puppies in training as well as our working guide dogs. Yeah, that's great. So you said that when someone applies, they go through an application process and they, do you go do an in-home interview as part of that application? We sure do, yep. We we go and visit the home and make sure it's a secure and safe place for one of our guide dog puppies to stay. And it also gives the potential raisers the opportunity to ask any questions and get to know our puppy uh, raising coordinator a little bit better. And um, it's just a real smooth process. Um, it's, all of our raisers really enjoy, enjoy each other and enjoy going on outings. And it's just yeah. really cool. It is a family. You know, these raisers are actually building the foundation that these puppies need to be successful working guide dogs. And without this puppy raising program, we couldn't do the formal training and the placement and everything else. So they're very, they play a very, very important role for Occupaz. That's great. Well, and I wanted to ask you, as a person who, you said that you do community training, so that means you go into their home and work with them. How much time do you spend um, working with an individual in those, I believe you said it's um, four weeks of that? It's about a two to three week process, depending on your skills and how fast you take to the training and what what your individual situation is and what you need that dog to do. The actual formal harness training part of it when they're learning how to guide a blind person, that's about a three to four month process. Once they complete that, then we can do the placement training in that client's home and that's it's about a two to three week time period. We allow three weeks sometimes. It doesn't take that long. You have to prove that you are a safe and effective team before we can say that you are graduated. And so what is your graduation process? We have we follow the standard of training that's set forth by the International Guide Dog Federation and we follow their standards to produce quality and consistency. And we have to make sure that team follows or we have to make sure that that team that we're placing can work that dog safe and effectively. And once that our instructor determines that they're in a safe and effective working team and we've covered everything that we need to cover with them as far as commands and all that kind of stuff, then we can we can call them graduated. And we actually do hold a graduation ceremony for each each of our graduates. So they have their time in the spotlight and that, that lets all the puppy raisers and the sponsors and the donors come and meet the team and it's just real great. We're small and so we're more family orientated and it's just been wonderful. Oh, that's so nice. I know my first service dog agency, I had to go away to a team training, and we had a graduation. And I call it the tearjerker session because, I mean, it was <laughs> yeah. so emotional. With And I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't realize how emotional and what a tender moment it was. I knew it was a special moment, but I really didn't realize until my puppy raiser 
my dog's puppy razor arrived. And I mean, the, the tears started to flow. <laughs> it doesn't get easier either. It's every graduate has a different story and it's a different situation. And as the president and the main speaker, it never gets easier for me either. I thought it would, but I've cried at every one. <laughs> I know, I know. It's just, it is really emotional when you really realize all the love and care and hopes and dreams that go into each animal. And right. that just really is, you can just, you can feel that so strongly in a room. And until you've experienced one of those graduations, you really can't get a feel for how special and wonderful it is and, and how much, how many lives it's changed. You know, not right. only the, the person that's getting the dog, but with the puppy raiser and all the different people that that puppy touched and it's time growing up to become a working dog. It's just the coolest thing. We're expanding our services now to include children. Um, typically across the country, um, many guide dog training programs don't work with youth that, uh, that are under the age of 16. And so our newest program that we're launching is called Children's Visual Companion Dogs. And what these dogs will do is they will go into family homes that have children with visual disabilities, and we work with the parents of the, the blind child, and we teach them how to navigate a dog around obstacles and changes in elevation and everything a blind person expects a dog to navigate around. And in turn, this child holds on to a special harness, and it is giving those kids just very, very strong sense of independence, profound pride, and increased self-esteem and responsibility. And it's just kind of bridging the gap to independence for them and also priming them to use a guide dog when they're older and able to go through the, the guide dog mobility training program. Oh, that's wonderful. And so what ages are you looking at in the youth? Um, we're starting at around age 3 and going up to about age 11 or 12. Um, around, you know, between 9 and 12 is when they when blind youth really get proficient at their cane skills. And these dogs will only be used with these kids, you know, when they're with their parents. Um, they can take them out into public. They're not going to be going to school with these kids because they do need to, they still need to learn their, their, cane, tra their cane travel with their vision teachers um, and be independent at school. But this is just a mobility aid for them when they're out shopping with mom and dad. They're going places with their parents and they, they don't want to hang on to mom and dad. They'd rather hold on to the dog's harness handle. And it's a real big comfort for these blind boys, too, these blind kids, oh. too. Currently, That's we're working with three blind boys right now um, in our pilot program, and their their lives are changing. One of the parents, Kim Ward, who helped us develop this program, said it has just changed her kid's life immensely. Going to doctor appointments and dentist appointments and <laughs> all that scary stuff that kids have to do and then being blind on top of it escalates that fear a little bit more and these dogs are just, they're just changing lives. That's, all, that's what it's all about. That is so wonderful. I love that concept. And I don't think I've ever heard of that, of working with, with children that young with, with a guide dog. That's awesome. Yeah, they're, they're not actually trained guide dogs per se to go out without um, a parent, but they are bridging the gap to get these kids ready to use a guide dog and they'll already understand the pull of the dog and the harness handle and learn. They're learning how to follow a dog is pretty much what they're doing as well as gaining their more independence and Right. It's going to be a super program. Yeah, that's wonderful. I love that. That's a great, great idea. So after someone receives their guide dog and they've graduated, they've been determined that they're, um, they're safe together, what is your follow-up process? Is there any additional follow-up work that's done? Do you check back in with them after so long, or are they on their own for good? Oh, no, they're not on their own for good. And one nice thing about us being a local program and working with people in our own community is we are right here. We are right next door. So if there's any problem or concern or they have any questions, that we're a phone call away. Um, sometimes we're only five minutes away if we need to get there and work with them on an individual basis. But, no, our follow-up is on an as-needed basis. We do a formal follow-up um, and check up on them about a year after they their graduation date and then every year after that. 
Oh, that's great. I know um, Whistle and I have to go through a recertification process. Yeah, every about 18 months to two years, we have to go through all of our commands and, and our trainer has to view us in public and at home, do all of that. And they call it a recertification process. And I really oh. like that yeah, because it... Yeah, well, I love that you're just a phone call away. That's so nice that um, because you never know what's going to come up. Or I've had some issues with my dogs where something scared them. One of my dogs was attacked when I was getting on an elevator in Washington, D.C. Um, oh, to go no. get on the metro. Yeah, I would have never have expected that. And so she, of course, had some issues that, that happened out of that that we had to work through. Yeah, so, you know, the one thing that I learned about having a working dog is – they're not robots. They're sensitive. They have feelings. They get upset. And Absolutely. you really have you have to work with them. Yeah, and you have to understand those things and, and really work with their strengths and deal with their weaknesses. Yep, and you bet. And the, the longer you work with a dog, the more in tuned you are to it and the more you guys become a seasoned team. And that's what we find with the guide dogs, too, is, you know, when you first start out with a dog, it's kind of rough and rocky and... It's all, you know, it's kind of a new experience for the dog and the person. And boy, after six months to a year, they're just like hand in glove. It's really cool to see that relationship form. And just from my own personal experience working Dale um, without crying on the radio here, <laughs> it's pretty, it's, it's pretty emotional, you know, realizing, you know, this dog saved my life a few times. I'm sure there's times that I don't even know about where he's avoided something catastrophic and I just couldn't go out in public without him it's really hard my husband I feel kind of bad but he he runs me into more things than my dog does and <laughs> you know they are <laughs> they are still dogs they aren't perfect but I, I gotta tell you they're more reliable than than the human eye almost and it's just incredible I wouldn't trade that mobility tool in for anything yeah. Well, I I feel the same way. And that bond, you know, I always thought I was pretty independent as a woman with a disability until I got my first service dog. And I was blown away, just like you're describing, of the independence of the things I had been missing out on that I wasn't even aware of until I had my dog and gained that independence that is just such a gift. You just, words can't can't describe it. Only tears, I think, can describe it really how dignity. deep that is yeah dignity is a big word for me too I just feel I feel proud to be out there as a blind person with my guide dog and I never felt that way when I was out there with the white cane so for me the, the guide dog is just it gives me so much more and I'm I'm a lot more comfortable and it's a door opener too people will talk to me now when I have the dog oh what a nice dog and you know you make a lot of friends it opens doors especially for this kid program that we're developing these kids are going to be able to make some really nice friends and people aren't going to be so scared of the disability. I right. wish they do more in our public schools about getting kids, you know, more comfortable with approaching people that have a problem and we're trying yeah, to help, just, just trying to bridge difference. that gap a bit. Right. Right, I know. Well, it's the same for me. I used to hate sitting somewhere waiting on someone because I always felt like people were staring at me as being a wheelchair user. And now I don't have any problem with it with my service dog because people are staring at my service dog and they want right. to ask questions about him. They don't care about my wheelchair. They're more interested in my dog, which is wonderful. Yeah, pe you know, people with disabilities aren't so contagious when you have a dog with you. That's seems. right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nicole, I am so sorry our time is up. It has been such a delight visiting with you today and learning about the Occupaws Guide Dog Association. And I just have one last question for you, and that is how can people get in touch with you and your organization if they want to volunteer or donate money or time? What's the best way to reach you? Um, all of our contact information and our donation information is on our website at occupaws.org. It's O-C-C-U-P-A-W-S dot org. And you can find out more information there. And we sure need some support and we need help and we need dollars to make this program fly. Anything you can do to help would be excellent. Well, thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing. And thank you for joining us on Working Like Dogs. And we hope you'll come back and visit with us again in the future. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, and thank you, our listeners, for being with us. We hope you've enjoyed our show today. And I hope that you'll visit us at PetLifeRadio.com. 
and please feel free to send any questions or comments or ideas for a future show. You can email me at marcy at petliferadio.com. So for myself and Whistle, thank you for joining us, and we hope you'll come back again real soon and visit PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.